Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And I had never considered it, but Mark has convinced me we need to have a Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Completely yeah. just convinced me. Also here, John Schnepp. Yeah, not only Taco Tuesday, we're going to have like a band Wednesday, like a live band. So if you're in any kind of band, mariachi band, <laughs> uh, we're going to have the band right here. So write it, write us in, and uh, I won't be in charge of this. Do not write in. We're, we're not make, actually going I to do that. I have nothing to do with this, but a band might be Mark, playing. you want to join the conversation? <laughs> I do, but I mean, you're being a little disrespectful to the band that is here that shows up every day to play oh, that guitar on. riff. Hey, guys, I'm sorry about him. <laughs> yes, but they get no on-screen time. That was I know. No on-screen <laughs> time. No, no tacos on Tuesday. <laughs> But it's happening. Campia said so. <laughs> All right, let's get started. All right, for decades now, fans of the original Arnold Schwarzenegger classic, Conan the Barbarian, have been patiently <laughs> waiting for a third installment of the franchise, <laughs> not counting the Jason Momoa reboot from a few years ago. At a recent event in the UK, Arnold himself gave an update on the project, assuring his fans that it is indeed still on the way. He said the following. Conan the Conqueror, where I'm sitting on the throne for years and years, decades, and then all of a sudden the time comes when they want to overthrow me. So that story will be told and that movie will be done. The comments are consistent with what producer Frederick Malmberg recently said. Yes, Chris Morgan, the screenwriter, and I are meeting with directors at this moment. Interest is high, many are fans of Conan, but we are not rushing. We have a great script, and now we need the right director for the job. Schnepp, are we actually going to get a new Conan movie, or is it too late? I think they should wait at least another 20 years. What do you mean you're not <laughs> rushing? It's 34 years ago that he's been sitting on this throne. I would just start shooting him in that in that suit, just brooding on a weird Lazy Susan, and just get it done, man. The man is 68 years old. Why are you not rushing? <laughs> Mark? I agree. I mean, they're sitting on the throne and then there's Elvis dead on the toilet. Like, how long can we possibly wait before it just becomes, there's just no more interest anymore. Uh -huh. And I get that interest would be high amongst like screenwriters or directors who grew up admiring the original Conan. But it's like, I personally, I don't have a lot of interest in a project like this. And I'm not sure where all these fans they're saying are are clamoring for this new project. Sure, you can love what you saw from the other Conan movies, but I just don't know that people care that much about a Schwarzenegger project in general anymore. The box office certainly doesn't indicate that there's a desire to see more Schwarzenegger on screen. I love watching the dude in anything. I would get a little excited to see a trailer with him on the throne. He's got the long hair again, and then yeah. they try to overthrow him. I just, I, that Jason Momoa reboot put such a bad taste in my mouth that I'm not sure that you can do this project right in today's day and age. I'm just, I don't see it. I can tell you what, I have hope for this project. I think it will happen and I think it's a good idea. And here's why. If you'd asked me a few years ago, what one project could Arnold Schwarzenegger come back in that I think people would actually be interested in? My answer wouldn't have been Terminator, although I thought there was some interest in Terminator. It would be Conan. And here's the neat thing about Conan over, say, Terminator or anything else like this. For Terminator or a lot of these other projects that you're coming back to, you're kind of re-envisioning it, right? This would literally be a proper sequel. Mm -hmm. You know, he's at the age now, it's kind of like we were talking about with the new Star Wars. This guy's at the age now that you'd want him to be at that age. And in hearing him talk about it, he says, look, this won't be campy like the Jason Momoa version of although that movie had potential and it just went in the wrong Momoa direction. Momoa had potential Lots as of, right. Yeah, Tony, totally but, did, yeah. went in the wrong direction, uh, all that kind of stuff. But he also said this would be like, this would be the true sequel to the original Conan, kind of imagining that Conan the Destroyer didn't exist, right. which is also the right move to do. Right. And if you've seen him in those two, I don't know what, if Arnold's hard up for money right now, he's doing those mobile game like ads. Gears like, of War or something, or, or defense, war, games of war. Best yeah. defense is defense. Yeah. But then it's got a, that one shot of him sitting in his chair getting his makeup done and it's got his arm shown. It's like his, his arm is as big as it has ever <laughs> been in history. This is the time. Now is the time to do it. I agree with you. I don't think they need to start shooting this next month, but this has to be in production in the next like 14 months. Yeah. It has to start production before at that he's point. 70. Yeah, but I think they will make it, and I think it has a shot if they actually go back to the spirit of the original, to the original graphic novels, and all that kind of stuff. If they do that, I think people will get interested. 
And I think it can work. Not a billion dollar movie, but I think it can work. Let's see what the name of the director is that they finally settle on. Like, like who are all these huge fans of, of Conan that really want to make this movie that they're interviewing right now? Could they have a director that actually has a name that has a clout in Hollywood that's like, that, that would get all of us excited? It's like, oh, you know what? If this person thinks that they can put a new spin on the old war, then I'd want to see the movie. I just don't know who that person would be. And I would certainly hope that they stick, like you said, with the original kind of the John Milius feel. They got to bring back the Basil Polidorus, the dun 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 dun, yeah. dun 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 dun, the theme of Conan. If you go back and really get the original Conan and make the, a true sequel to that and show him on the throne, that, you know, just don't say, well, he's been sitting on the throne for decades and decades because that makes me tired. <laughs> makes me like, laugh. I, I get like, ah, my back is hurting. Get up and walk around. Conan. He's got skin sores yeah. on the bottom of his legs. Oh, he's sitting like, on the throat. Finally, <laughs> they're here to overthrow me. It's like they, it's 40 years. It's like, you know, he's been in so That's the whole thing about that Conan movie. He's been in so many different adventures. Here's but one of them. So it's not like he's just sitting around. He's been doing a ton of stuff. But I want to see, I do want to see a true sequel before I die of that Conan the Barbarian <laughs> movie. And hopefully Arnold, these guys do it. So I'm, I'm into it. I just want it now. So. All right. What's next? We've known for some time that a sequel to the original sci-fi classic Blade Runner was in development with Ryan Gosling, joining original star Harrison Ford. But now it looks like we actually have a production start date. According to reports, the new Blade Runner film will start shooting in July. The film is being helmed by Sicario and Prisoners director Denis Villeneuve and will will have Roger Deakins serve as cinematographer. Mark, your thoughts on the new Blade Runner going into production? Now this is some concrete, solid news we can all get excited about for the most part. I mean, it's going into production in, in, in July, which is still a ways off, but it's like, yeah, this thing is happening, and it's been so long in the process to hear the names. Like, it's being directed by Denny, and he's bringing his boy Deacons, and then you have Brian Gosling and Harrison Ford. This is something I got to get excited about. You know why? Because now I'm going to have to go back and see Blade Runner, <laughs> which I've never seen before. What? It's a hole. It's a gap. I, I would feel it would be disingenuous, movie talk fans, if I sat here and said, Mo, because I love the original so much, I got to see it. I haven't seen it yet. I promise I'll check it out. Well, uh, then we've got a nice broad spectrum. We've That's got right. hasn't seen it, loves it didn't like the original. Well, oh. I, yeah, I'm one of the only guys in, in the known universe. Who, I don't know what my problem is. I'm one of the only guys in the world. I've tried to force myself to like it so I can be like all the other cool kids, <laughs> but I just cannot. I cannot. I just don't like it. And so I have not been big on them doing another one, but they wore me down. Denny, Deacons, Ryan Gosling on board, Harrison Ford coming back. I, look, I, I got to say, even though I didn't like the original, I'm one of the only human beings who didn't. I sit back and I look at all of this at this point. I'm like, they've got a really nice little cinematic package here they're putting together. So even though I didn't like the original, I kind of now suddenly find myself really looking forward to this new one. So. I should have faked it. I should have faked no. it that we could have ganged up on it no. again. You know, I love that you haven't seen it because now we're going to have an actual screening here at the yes, office. I'm going to bring right. in because I've got the full super sweat fest. All five discs will watch the, the new. Oh, we got to watch that. And then we got to watch Grandma's Boy because yeah. he hasn't seen Grandma's Boy So we'll do that. Either. We'll do a <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the two, the two <laughs> the historical two gaps in my movie right. viewing. Well. <laughs> And the, the room. room. He's got to watch the yeah. room. Not room. Was it an Android? Not room. We don't know. The room. Yeah. room. Uh, so I am super excited about this. I've loved Blade Runner for uh, many years, almost as many years as I've loved Conan, because that also came out in the summer of 1982, 34 years ago. We've got like this wow. 1982 thing going on. Conan came out in, uh, I think it was May, and then Blade Runner came out in June of 1982. Both mm -hmm. of those films, and they're both getting sequels. It's like Rocky and Star Wars again. You know, it's like this like weird kind of. Like it's in the air I you were somewhere. Say Rocky and Bullwinkle. I have no idea why. <laughs> and Bull, Rocky, and, <laughs> no right, kids? Why. You know what I'm talking. Rocky and Bullwinkle. Now I have seen Rocky and Bullwinkle. You're now proud yeah. father of a oh, dead moose. Yeah, that, and that movie bombed really bad. Where? What happened to us? Yeah. We got we got thrown away into the jail. So, um, yeah, Blade Runner. The, all the all these all the director is incredibly talented, and I, I gotta say, I'm I'm glad that they they're not going with 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 Ridley Scott. I know he's producing it. You know, I know he's doing the Aliens franchise now. And, it, you know, he's a reason, a big reason Blade Runner is such an amazing film. It was his choices, along with, you know, the writers. But it was really his vision of Blade Runner. So I'm hoping that uh, they they brought back the original writer, Hampton Fancher, even though he got rewritten multiple times. There's all these different people's, 
you know, yep. storylines. They got Harrison Ford. I'm really interested to see what they're doing within this world of Blade Runner. Because you got to remember, like, Blade Runner, when it came out, I was a little kid. I didn't like it when it came out because it didn't have a lot of lasers. I was like, I thought it was going to be like, <laughs> Harrison Ford in the future with like a star. Nope, it's not Star Wars. It's depressing. It's actually like a really well-told adult film. It's an R rating. It's, you know, it's you're in a science fiction dystopia. So I want, I really want that to be the, I'm hoping that that is like the way the sequel is. The sequel takes place like another 30 years into the future. So hopefully, I'm hoping the the sequel of Blade Runner comes out in 2019 when Blade Runner was actually supposed to take place in 1982. <laughs> it was like, the year is Los Angeles, 2019. <laughs> now we're going to be in the future. So now it'll be, the year is 2057. <laughs> like, yes, what yeah. does Los Angeles look like? So. But I know I want the first trailer. This is what I want in the first trailer for the new Blade Runner. I want it to be like an apartment. A door opens. Harrison Ford comes in with Rudger Hauer. And he says, Eddie, we're home. <laughs> and then, <laughs> that's your first trailer right there. <laughs> All right, folks. We reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Disney has been developing a live action adaptation of Ghost in the Shell for some time with Scarlett Johansson in the lead role and a March 31st, 2017 release date. However, reports have now come out that Disney has dropped the project altogether and Paramount Studios will now be producing the film. According to the story in Variety, all the relevant details are remaining the same, with Snow White and the Huntsman Helmer Rupert Sanders directing the movie and the March 31st, 2017 release date staying intact. John Byers sell that this studio change will affect Ghost in the Shell much. I uh, sell that it'll affect it very much. It, it sounds like they're far enough along in the process. They got the director on board. They got the writers on board. They got their stars on board. It sounds like this thing is probably already pretty much locked. Why Disney decided to ditch it, I don't know. Whether it was a deal that Paramount made with them or whether it was a scenario of Disney just ditched it and Paramount swooped in and said, we'll take it. I, I don't know what it was. I have a feeling there was probably some sort of deal involved, although those details aren't being released at this point. But for now, when I sit back and look at this, it, it seems to me that this is probably going to end up being the exact same movie it would have been had it still be, been at Disney. So yeah, I, I sell that it's going to have much effect at all, Mark. Yeah, I, I sell it too. It is just curious to see that Disney's just like, ah, you know what, we tried it, we're good. Anybody else want some of this? And Paramount showed up, and w which they probably were smart in doing. I mean, it sounds like a property that could have some legs to it. You have Scarlett Johansson is one of the stars of it. Plus, it just it's an idea idea that I think is going to work in a film standpoint. Now, hardcore fans of Ghost in the Shell, they weren't huge fans when this was initially announced because you have Scarlett Johansson, and that's not traditionally who the fans would expect to see in Ghost in the Shell. But having said all of that, it's, it's a good idea to make this movie, in my opinion. Maybe Disney was just too busy with their whatever their upcoming slate is in 2017 and they have the Beauty and the Beast live action they got Star Wars they have you know Marvel and all that stuff so maybe they just got too packed as far as a budgetary concern but I think for all the stars and the director and everybody else involved you're just showing up to a different place in Hollywood to make the rest of your movie and we still get to see it well, Disney's in the Scarlett Johansson business because she's going to be yeah. in Avengers, Infinity War. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe they're just like, I don't think that, you know, we'll have back to back Scarlett Johansson's competing for our money. But I think, uh, could it be the rating? Because Ghost in the Shell, the animated movie, was R rated. Could it be that they were like, look, we're going to go, it's going to get a little, it's going to be PG 13, maybe R. And Disney was like, whoa, we don't do R. Could that be it? Or? Well, but then Disney would just say, no, make it PG-13. Right. And that's no, what you're it right. would have been. So. It's a, that's a weird one. I, I'd like I, to I, want, I can't help but wonder if we're going to find out in the next two months that another property that once belonged to Paramount, Disney now has. Like I, I just mm. wonder if there was some back-channel deal that was made to set this up. Maybe it wasn't. I'm just right. speculating. It, it does point. seem like they played pretty nice together this summer, uh, or the last summer, when you know they had Rogue Nation was coming yeah, out. Right. And yeah. they're like, hey, can you guys not talk about Star Wars Rogue One until we get Rogue Nation? out and there was like I don't know what that deal looked like but it seemed like it was pretty cordial so I guess they have a solid relationship all right what's next new images from the upcoming issue of Empire magazine have surfaced online giving us a few new looks at the upcoming Batman versus Superman one image in particular has the fan community buzzing with Batman looking out over a landscape of destruction and what appears to be the Omega symbol pointing to the DC villain Darkseid Jeanette Byersell at this image points us to Darkseid being set up as the villain for the forthcoming Justice League films 
<laughs> Parademons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's the Omega symbol. Dark side blasts out the Omega beams coming out of his eyes. So this is it's definitely dark side. And I'm so geeked out and like nerding. When I saw that last night, I was like, wow, you're it's so cool that they're like, yeah. Everyone knows it's a Batman vision. It's a whatever the Dark Knight nightmare, whatever they keep calling it, is based on the toys and stuff. So it's really cool to see that it's not just a nightmare that he's going to wake up sweating like Alfred. You know, give me a milkshake. It's actually some kind of <laughs> weird vision of the future or a possible future that might mean like, hey, I've got to assemble a team. So that could be the dawn of the Justice League. You know, so I, I'm super excited to see how, where does this dream sequence fall in? How does he have it? Like, I mean, we were t joking like about like, well, is Wonder Woman's lasso? How does how does this happen? How does he get this like weird fugue state dream of a possible future? But whatever it is, they're talking about it, describing it like it's like a Mad Max crazy action sequence with Batman, like fighting all these different, you know, Superman villains and also parademons. I don't even know how it's going to all fit in, but I'm excited to see that Darkseid's going to be teased. I remember when we got those images of the, of the nightmare with a K. Right. Get, get it? Anyway, <laughs> I, I remember when they first showed those images and we saw the parademons. I remember thinking, okay, is that just, okay, so clearly it's a nightmare, but are the parademons, is that just like an Easter egg for the audience, a little wink, like not really, you know, Darkseid's parademons. Right. The giant omega symbol is not some random little no. look off to the side. If you look really closely, you can see the omega symbol. No, it's the omega <laughs> symbol. <laughs> Clearly dark side. But that's the biggest question that I had as well. It's like, wait a minute. Unless Zack Snyder has gone totally off the rails and he's actually going to give Batman some superpowers. Like Batman has precognition or something like that. And he has Batman has visions of the future. Ever since I was a little boy, I could see the future. <laughs> like I told my mom not to go down that aisle. No, no. Like, so yeah. like how how is he having this nightmare? How does he see this? It's a great question. We don't need to answer it right now. But it does put those parademon images we put totally into context. Mm. This is plain black and white. I wish we had thought to pull up an image actually of Darkseid. So for those of you who may not know, uh, Darkseid is kind of like, I'm not saying which one came first. I'm just saying Darkseid is kind of like the DC version of Thanos. That's, that's a very simple way to put it. He's like a, a big level 10 boss. Um, so that ultimately would be a great threat level that could bring the Justice League together. So that seems to be... Now, maybe... I don't think we're going to see him in this movie. Maybe a post credit scene? Mm. Maybe? But I don't think we're actually going to see Darkseid himself in the movie. But I, I, obviously, this points directly to Darkseid. I buy that completely. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking you. Apocalypse from X-Men. Apocalypse yep. where it's like, you know, yep. Days of Future Past where we got that tease at the end. We didn't necessarily see anything. We didn't see much, but we knew what was coming next. That's a clear indication as to what's coming next. I read about this before I actually saw the image. And I was like, oh, it'll just be this little Omega symbol that it's like, it, it, like, like ghost hunters. It's like, no, that's a ghost. It's like, dude, that's an orb, okay? There's a problem with your camera. It's not a ghost. This is, that's, that's the Omega symbol. It's, this is dark side, kids. This is not, we're, 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 there's no bones about it. That is what's going to be happening. That's what we're leading into with the Justice League. And I'm like you guys. I am now, like, my excitement level has always been super high to see Batman v Superman. And then it wavers a little bit, judging on what clip I, I just saw or what version or what picture I just saw. That puts it right <laughs> back at like 11 out of 10 now. All right, what's next? Uh, we're going to opening this week. Oh my gosh, it is already? Yeah, already. Oh my gosh, okay. Well, we, it's time for us, <laughs> since it is Tuesday, to talk about what is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. We've got a bunch of movies opening up this week. We're only tackle one right now, so Ashley, what's on deck? The first film we're looking at this week is the new Disney film, The Finest Hours, based on a true story. On February 18th, 1952, a massive storm splits the SS Pendleton in two, trapping more than 30 sailors inside the tanker's sinking stern. Engineer Ray Seibert bravely takes charge to organize a strategy for his fellow survivors. As word of the disaster reaches the Coast Guard in Chatham, Massachusetts, Chief Warrant Officer Dale Clough orders a daring rescue mission despite the ferocious weather. Coast Guard Officer Bernie Weber takes three men on a lifeboat to try and save the crew against seemingly impossible odds. John, what did you think of The Finest Hours? Yeah, um, I actually got to go and see The Finest Hours at the world premiere yesterday. I went with uh, our own Natasha Martinez came along with me actually watched the movie and and here's the thing everything I went to go see this movie for was awesome 
What wasn't awesome was all the stuff I didn't go to see the movie for. And, and, and here, there's basically two movies that go on at once in this film. You have everything going on at sea. So you got Chris Pine on his way. You got Chris Pine and um, uh, and his guys off to rescue the guys in the boat where Casey Affleck and his guys are. They need to be rescued. And everything that revolves around those aspects of the movie are awesome. Casey Affleck crushes it in this movie. Totally does. Ben Foster's excellent in this movie as well. And that's all great. The problem with the movie is that, without giving spoilers away, is there is a love interest to the uh, Chris Pine character back on land. And they keep going back to her on land for absolutely zero reason. Absolutely zero reason that has zero impact on anything going on in the story. So it's like these high seas, crashing waves, aren't going under the water, blah, blah, blah. Let's cut back to land and watch Chris Pine's girlfriend get stuck in a snowbank. <laughs> and then let's go back out to sea and blah, blah, blah. And it's fine if you're just going back there for a minute or two, but it's like ignore, unbalanced amounts of time were spent back on shore that had little to nothing to do with what was going out on the ocean. And that really put a big damper. Oh, no pun intended, actually, no. uh, on on the rest of the film. <laughs> so I would say this. The good, to me, outweighs the bad. Because that stuff at sea and the story... And when you realize this is a true story, and then at the, they do one of those things a lot of true story movies did, where in the end credits, they show you a lot of the actual footage, the character next to the actual person in real life, wow. and all this kind of stuff. And you realize this was a true story. It floors you. And for me, all that great stuff outweighed the negative but this to me is a good movie that should have been a great movie and you know i've looked online and right now it's got like a 20 as of this morning it had like a 20 percent on rotten tomatoes oh really and i get it i do I, I totally get why enough people were turned off enough by the stuff that turned me off i'm just letting you guys know for me personally that good stuff was great and it was great enough to outweigh the negative. So I ended up enjoying it. I recommend you see it, but you'll probably walk out going, man, there was a missed opportunity here because this could have been one of the year's best films. Mm. It really could have been and it was hampered by a split personality a lot. Anyway, Mark, have you been looking forward to this one? Uh, I, I, I have. I remember seeing The Finest Hours when you and I and Christian were at the D23. Uh, we went to the live action day yeah. and The Finest Hours just seemed like another movie because we were so excited for Star Wars and Jungle Book Blow Us Away and like, oh, are we going to see what Emma Watson looks like as Belle and Beauty and the Beast? And then they have The Finest Hours presentation and it's like, okay, this is another movie that's coming out. But the based on a true story aspect of it and the, the fact that these are real people that were risking their lives to save each other that is what really gets me into a theater. I love watching those kind of movies. So just based on that premise alone, I want to see this movie. I have the chance to see it tonight. So I'm looking forward to checking it out. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that, you know, I wasn't really looking forward to seeing it. But after hearing what you said, you know, I, I kind of am a little more interested now to see like the drama unfold in, on the sea and then maybe like go take a bathroom break. Is it long enough? To, like, <laughs> I was say, go now get we a, know when yeah, our pee breaks are. Yeah, okay, it, go get a refill. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. All right, folks, we reached out part of the show now for mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, for those of you watching us live, we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. Just tweet on into us right now at Collider Video, and Ashley will pick out a few at the end of the show. But for now, Let's see what you guys sent us in the mailbag. So Ashley, what do we got? Ben Cartwright writes, Hi Collider, big fan of the show. Yourselves along with other critics have slated the fifth wave another teen novel film that has failed to be a hit. Some of my personal favorite novels have all had busts and failed to make sequels. I am number four, Aragon, etc. And those which have gotten sequels have been disappointing. Divergent and The Maze Runner. My question is, with Hunger Games and Twilight aside, why do you think it is so hard for companies to produce a good version of these much-loved novels? Thanks and keep bringing the filthy. Because contrary to popular belief, and you guys have heard me say this a lot, it's almost impossible to make a good movie. Making a good movie is a monumental feat. Making something in a subjective medium like the film business that people are gonna sit down and you will engage with them on whatever level engages them and they enjoy it and like it and you turn out a quality product, that is Herculean in, in nature. And that's why we, like those of us at this table, have such big respect for filmmakers who can do it well, especially those who can do it well on a consistent basis. So let's get that away. It's hard to make a good movie, period. 
But then you get into this other issue that I think a lot of people lose sight of, that just because something is a good novel does not necessarily mean it will make a great movie. I, I say this a lot. We talk about it in comic books a lot. Like sure. whether it's you know certain storylines or certain costumes or certain aesthetics. We often, you'll hear us say quite a bit, just because something works on a printed page or in a, in a photo or in a drawing does not mean that will necessarily translate well into a different medium in the big screen and play out well there. So you take a lot of these novels that might work really great as novels, but they may not translate very well into great movies. So it all depends on the interpretation, the adaptation of it as well, but it is a tough, tough task. Don't underestimate how difficult it is to take, especially pre-existing material like that, and turn it into a take it, transport it into a completely different medium and make something good and watchable out of it. It's tough. Schnepp, you've done it. Yeah, right. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I mean, and also specifically for this young adult kind of craze that's been going on, I mean, you could target it right back to Twilight. So after Twilight made a lot of money for that stu for different studios, everybody got jumped on this. Oh, this train of like these uh, you know teens that are reading these books. Let's get in on that. So you've seen so many uh, and only a few are hits mocking uh, you know the Hunger Games. That's that's the one that kind of sticks out to me. And then hundreds of failures. I mean, I think we're almost in, like I'm not even I'm exaggerating very slightly. I think there's like 30 young adult films that have come out since Twilight that have all failed not including the Hunger Games. I mean, you got the Mortal Instruments, you got, I mean, there's so many to list The City off. of Bones, we both did, it was Bone. great. Yeah, yeah well, right, City, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we love City, City of Bones. Yeah, we subtitled the <laughs> City of Suck, just so you know. Um, is but, it good? Is that, is that <laughs> not, yeah. that's not it's, ideal? That is that means, the kitty slang Mark, for good? That means it's perfect, <laughs> perfectly poopy. Um, it's, it, you're, you're right, it's rough, but then you're also taking this thing that's like a lot harder to translate, which is like, why did this work for kids and you're like, well, it's sort of like when you watch when you're like eight and you're watching like Flappy's War, some weird animated series that only, you know, like you have the Flappy box and the, all these different things that you're, you're eight and it kind of makes sense. Then you're in your 30s. You're like, I remember Flappy. Let's watch that. And it's it's just like horrible. It only works for the time period that you are. You know, it's made specifically. It's targeted specifically for your age group. And I think a lot of these young adult books are really kind of targeted for the age group where in like you're in high school, you have problems fitting in, they or you're like, this guy's hot, this chick's amazing. It's like it's very simplistic. And only the ones that are really well written are the ones that rise to the top. You'll see like even Fifty Shades of Grey is sort of like was, you know, written as fan fiction. Twilight it, fan as fiction. Twilight yeah. fan fiction, but it's it, I haven't read it, but I've heard it's horribly written. So I mean people are like read books constantly. Like, I, I eat I eat books for breakfast. They're like, it's horrible. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough racket. I mean, so there's a, it's, it's, you're, you're betting, you know, a lot of studios are like, well, what about this one? Or what, do, you know, they don't really know. They're like buying these books in bulk and like, which ones can we develop into the next Hunger Games or Twilight? So, you know, it's, a, it's really tough. So it's, it's hard to tell really, I mean, but just because it's a bestseller really doesn't mean anything. I mean, the issue I have, and I don't read anything. I don't read anything that's longer than a pamphlet. Like I, I don't <laughs> leaf through books that often. And I think the issue that you have in making these movies from novels is that you have such a fervent fan base, and they cannot wait to sink their teeth into the movie. And so, to please them, you have to stick so close to the source material. When even comic book fans have accepted that a studio is going to change the story a little bit to serve a cinematic universe better. The few times that they have stuck to the source material and it's worked, I would say, is Harry Potter, where for whatever reason, maybe it was because J.K. Rowling did such a great job writing those and she had some sort of a cinematic vision in mind. I'm not sure. Same thing with The Hunger Games, but even by the time The Hunger Games wore off and the initial craze and you saw the end of the last Hunger Games movie, it's like, well, now they finally got pinned down and they had to stick to what actually goes on in the books, even though it did feel like it was a little forced, in my opinion, in the movie, which I otherwise thought was really good. So sometimes if you have to stick so close to the source material because the fans won't let you get out of those handcuffs, it's gonna hamper the movie. Um, the totally off topic, but you're saying that you don't read anything longer than a pamphlet, right? Right. Totally off topic. I don't know even why I'm telling the story. There's this great story, a true story, I believe it happened in Canada, it could be a little bit wrong, about reading. You're going to like the story because it's a story about reading. Okay. So there is this woman who, this is a true story, guys. Look it up. There's this woman who um, was using a contraceptive jelly and she ended up getting pregnant. And she, was, she sued the company that made the contraceptive jelly. She was suing them. Yeah. In court, what turned out was she didn't read the instructions 
on, on the contraceptive jelly. And what she did was she took the jelly, spread it on toast, and consumed the contraceptive jelly. Huh. Now, her argument, <laughs> your look is priceless right now. I'm starting to see <laughs> the air in her logic. So in court, her argument in court was basically this. When you're in the mood and things are happening, you don't really have time to read instructions. To which the greatest judge in the world responded, but you had time to make toast, <laughs> which is the greatest judge. So wow. how that came out of all this, I don't know. I warned you I was going way off on a tangent. Yes. But it's so, so hard to explain to little Junior why he lives in this mansion. <laughs> like, right. man, what? Mom, you don't work at all. How do we have all this stuff? Well, I sued the company that was responsible for making you. Kids, see idiocracy now. <laughs> this, I mean, oh, my God. <laughs> okay, sorry. I don't know why I went off on that tangent. So uh, let's get back to some mailbag questions. All right. Colin <laughs> Martinez writes, Hey guys, love the show. I know soccer isn't the biggest sport in America, but its popularity is definitely rising. So what do you guys think of a movie about the business and politics between the two biggest clubs in the world, Real Madrid and FC Barcelona? There's a lot of hate between the fans of both clubs, and there have been scandals, legal problems, and a couple of players who have played for both clubs who have gone on to be not the most liked people on the planet. Also, don't forget the only sports team more valuable than Real Madrid are the Cowboys. We'll love to hear your thoughts and keep up the amazing work. Nobody cares about soccer. Sing the song along. <laughs> which is really, nobody cares about soccer in North America, which is unfortunate. I mean, that sucks. I look, and I admit, I myself am not a big uh, soccer fan, or as some of my friends call it, football. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I am myself not a big, but I do watch every World Cup. I actually really get into it uh, when World Cup comes along. Um, but for whatever reason, the absolute most popular sport in the world has no traction in the U.S. Now, I, it's starting to get a little bit more popular, uh, but it's not a significant thing. So I don't think in the North American audience, which is where you know your biggest box office is made in North America as opposed to any of the other uh, individual territories in the world, I would be fascinated, and I think this could work here. Instead of about those two clubs... Something big just went down in, in FIFA with step uh, batter, mm -hmm. like the whole um, bribery controversy and scandal about who got a world award of the World Cup. When you actually start looking into that stuff, it is convoluted and it's like straight out of a, I don't know, like straight out of a, a whodunit movie almost in a lot of ways. You make a movie about that, focusing on the world of soccer, I think that gets people interested. I'm not quite sure that a movie about these two clubs that, I'll be honest, if I went out into the streets of Burbank right now, stopped five random people and say and mention the name of the clubs, I doubt one out of them would have heard of either one of the clubs, so I just don't know that it would work. I don't know. Mark, what do you think? I mean, you know, I, I, I could throw the names Ronaldo and Messi at you. That might get a little more traction, yep, but yep. I, I, I think that I, the FIFA story is interesting. Even these two clubs, though, sometimes, even if I'm not that interested in a sport, I'm not a huge soccer fan, I do like the World Cup, is that the movie can make me care about something I previously did not care about. I guess that's true with not just sports, but anything. But Invictus is a movie that I'm like, I'm not a big rugby guy. I don't, I don't really mm. care about it, but I like started getting into it. And I'm trying to think of soccer movies that I really cared about the sport. Look, I enjoyed Ladybugs because of Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> I like Bennett like Beckham. That was a cute story. Ooh, Kung Fu Soccer. Kung Fu Soccer. Is awesome. <laughs> is, I, wait, is it real? Sha or are we? Shaolin Soccer. Shaolin Soccer. Sorry. Shaolin, Shaolin Soccer. soccer yeah. I got okay, well now I got to check that one out too. You also have Victory with Sylvester Stallone, Stallone yeah. as maybe the shortest goalie in history. But I just... <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure that that I would care that much about it but if you say that it's because I don't know that much about the history. I know that, they, that, that they're, they're huge rivalries. They're the two biggest cities in Spain. Like a lot of stuff went down all the way going back to the 40s, I believe, with those two clubs. But I, it, it doesn't, it doesn't like just reading it on page doesn't excite me that much. But there's a lot of movies that have surprised me. That could be one of them. Yeah, Stephen Chow did that amazing yes, he did. Uh, soccer film. That's the only soccer film I would. Same uh, guy who did Kung Fu Hustle. Yes, not to be confused. Yeah. Ah. Kung Fu Hustle. Soccer, yeah. so and I, I don't even know if it was called Shaolin Soccer. Can someone look it up? I'm pretty sure it was Shaolin yeah, okay. Soccer. Yeah, it's great. Just look up Stephen it's Chow. Hilarious. You will laugh it your ass off. It is so funny. And it's not really about soccer, but it's, you know, 
You're when you said I was uh, I was in Europe and uh, was watching a rugby game, and mm -hmm. that is one of the most violent games. I, I'm amazed that America has not embraced that because everyone's into like people punching each other out. When you anybody these guys talk about sports, uh, white noise for me. I just hear white noise and start thinking about like what am I doing for the rest of the day? All right, I, I just phase out because I'm not a big sports person, and soccer definitely is not in there. Because believe me, if I had to rank it, it'd be like basketball and then football. And then like maybe tennis before I'm like gonna be rocking watching soccer. But I did I did watch some rugby and that the people who play rugby I got some intense respect for because that is some severe violence. You saw the tell the truth, you know, there's no there's nothing to protect you. Yeah. You're not wearing headgear, it's just dudes like savagely running and punching each other. It's insane. It's really like you're like, these are brutal animalistic creatures fighting for glory. It's like it's rugby. I mean, that's a movie, you know, like that's something soccer. I mean, look, I'm not saying anything that's wrong with soccer. It's dudes kicking a ball, a lot of like amazing jumps and craziness. Once again, what's the goal? Just so you know, get it over there, get over here. I'm not really, you know, I would go with maybe the all the president's men, like investigative journalists into the, you know, the weirdness of soccer. Maybe mm -hmm. that could be a good good way in for America. I don't know. If uh, have you ever seen the New Zealand All Blacks, the rugby team? No. It, yeah, a bunch of you probably seen it. Look it up online because if if I'm understanding right, they do this war dance before every match they have. It's like dun, 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 and they like they're screaming and yelling like. It's intimidating just to watch. Like, yeah, these these rugby players. It's are like <laughs> watching World of Warcraft. Like, it, like yeah. you're about to go into a battle, or like watching Gladiator or something like that. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it, it's impressive what they put themselves through. <laughs> All right, what's next? Ryan Strasser writes, "Hello, Collider. I was curious what your thoughts were on the absence of any Shazam movie news in the Dawn of Justice League special last week. Should we have any worries or change of mind about it since it was not mentioned in a special where Warner Brothers was showcasing all their future movies?" Thanks and keep up the great work. This is really odd. This is very, very odd because before Batman versus Superman, before all that kind of stuff, this is Kevin Sujihara. We got The Rock. He's going to be in Shazam and he's going to be Black Adam and it's going to come out in 75 years. <laughs> and then all these other movies come out. They're talking about all this other stuff. And it just left me going, why did you even bother making the announcement about? Dwayne The Rock Johnson is going to be in in uh, Shazam. And then why even bother Dwayne Johnson coming out and saying you're going to be Black Adam? What was the point? Because any momentum and any buzz you were going to generate with those announcements is gone now. We don't have a release date. We don't, I mean, not nothing solid at any rate. There's been some speculative stuff out there. We don't know anything about it. It's no closer to being in reality than it was 10 years ago. So this is a very odd situation. I've never understood... What DC? Now I'm excited about a Shazam movie very much, but I've never understood Warner Brothers' approach or Kevin Sujahara's philosophy on this film and how they've unraveled it and revealed it. It just seems really—I I won't say odd. I'll say it's dumb. They've handled this really dumb. It just hasn't been handled effectively. So as of right now, I have no idea. It's a great question because I think a lot of us are scratching our heads. I, I, I just feel like when that news was announced, that it was always used as like a a, a buffer or, or some sort of way to keep DC in the news when they didn't have anything to show you quite yet about an upcoming project they had, like a Batman v Superman, where you see so much Marvel news constantly, then DC is like, okay, well, let's make a splash here. Let's say we we know we have The Rock playing this role, whether it's in 2019, it doesn't matter. We're gonna make this announcement now because it, it'll keep <laughs> everybody excited that we have some stuff to look forward to as well. And maybe you didn't get them any saying any Shazam stuff in that special because they didn't need him in that special. They didn't need to bring up Shazam no. in that special. Maybe at the time they made those announcements and The Rock was teasing that he's going to be playing something, they needed some sort of press then. They don't need it now. They got Batman v Superman coming out. They have all these exciting movies now, so we can put him on the back burner for the time being, and then we'll we'll showcase him when it's right. Sure. Yeah, Shazam's a weird property. I mean, it was called Captain Marvel, and then you know Marvel and, and DC have been warring about that. Marvel won. They got a Captain Marvel movie coming out. Um, and now that that character's name is simply Shazam, as far as I understand, he's not called Captain Marvel anymore. Um, very weird. I mean, it's always struck me as weird to announce The Rock as Black Adam, because first of all, a lot of people don't even know who Shazam is, let alone his villain, mm -hmm. you know, Black Adam, and what, what's that all about? Um, and then they like, yeah, it's coming out in like 17 years or something. It's like feels like in 2019, I, yeah, we're in 2016, but we got a, a long road to get there. But once again, they haven't announced, you know, the Batman movie. 
or the Superman movie, the Superman sequel, we know those movies are going to be coming soon. Hopefully, it's not like 2020. It's like, come on, man, fit one of those in between. You know, I know you can do it. So I think they'll probably announce a Shazam film, maybe it, this, at, towards the end of this year, or maybe at Comic Con or something, at some kind of an event that's happening after Batman v Superman has already come out, and after they're able to, you know, judge what their their next slate of films are going to be from the either success or medium response of Batman v Superman. But I think Batman v Superman is going to have such a, a powerful response. You know, if they do everything right and what it feels like they're doing feels really right, that it could really launch the DC universe and they'll feel like we can we could put a landing date for Shazam. And I've heard speculation that The Rock is going to play both Shazam and Black Adam. So that'd be kind of cool right, if they right. finally figure it out and announce it and say this is what's happening and also kind of incorporate it into the DC universe. I feel like them making separate movies that. You know, look, if they're going to do the demon or swamp thing, I could see why they would or or even the Sandman would be in a separate, you know, vertigo universe. And it's not with all the superheroes. That makes sense because it's darker and it might might want to go R, just be in a different different world. But Shazam belongs in that in that superhero world. So I hope they're able to figure that out. All right, folks, so I said we'd take a little bit of time to take some of your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, you have a little bit of time left. Tweet on in some questions to Collider Video. Make sure you're following us on Twitter as well at Collider Video. So, Ashley, what have you picked out? Joe writes, in your opinion, which actors are great at accents? Oh, oh good question. Yeah. Man. I'll what? start it off. Yes. Rose Byrne has mastered yes. the American accent. You're right. Every she time totally I has. hear her talk in her regular voice, I always get taken aback because I forget that she has an accent. It's crazy. Michael Fassbender. You yeah. got Henry Cavill. All yeah. these English dudes are like, all of a sudden they sound just like, eh, they sound just like us, all stupid and American. Yeah. But actually, like, <laughs> we can get a couple of crumpets and tea and that's English. I'd like, say uh, Christian Bale is yes. uh, another guy where he talks and it's like, oh yeah, I forgot. That's that's how you sound. And the the, the kid who played uh, Jax in uh, Sons of Anarchy, uh, why am I forgetting his name? Oh. Uh, the the, the yeah. guy. In the yeah, music. Charlie. Charlie, Charlie Hunnam. Hunnam. Yeah. Because Charlie Hunnam, like, you know, he's talking about the club and then all of a sudden he's going, Crikey, mate! And like, right. and I oh, really? Really? I didn't yeah. even know that. I, I, I know. know what you would never know. know. He's got such a thick, twisted kind of multi-layered. Chris accent. Hemsworth, Hugh Jackman, Russell Crowe, all these people are not Americans, constantly speaking oh, 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 like us. It's a, well, they got a master. That's why they're rocking. It. You know, I, I I had no idea John Campion was Canadian. I had no idea he mastered <laughs> so well. I would also say uh, Mel Gibson was like Australian, and and he had a thick Australian accent to begin with, and then I think right. that it almost like disappeared because even when you see him just speaking as himself, it doesn't seem, whether he's drunk or sober, it doesn't seem like he has the Australian like accent nearly as much anymore. It just seems like it's just this little shade of what happened. So maybe when you live somewhere else for so long, it does like it does just disappear. Yeah, like Schwarzenegger. You'd never know he wasn't from here. <laughs> like you just, you'd never know. All right, what's next? Nerd for Hire wants you guys to talk about the Barbershop movie. Oh, oh, the, the barbershop's back. That yeah. was a trailer yeah. that I saw, and I was like, this is going to give Neighbors 2 a run for its money, because I like the first barbershop movie in particular mm -hmm. very, very much so. And I, I, I like some of it. I didn't laugh as much as I wanted to. It, it feels like they're going for a lot with this movie. They're not just going for laughs. They're also going to tug at your heartstrings about saving the barbershop, and I don't, I don't care about that much as much as I just want to laugh. So right. it feels like it's aiming. It, it's got a high reach on it. I wasn't thrilled with the trailer because because I felt like they were reaching in too many different directions. Right, right. I felt like they're going for comedy and they're going for like a, a save the shop and then they're going for socio political commentary with what's going on in the neighborhoods and stuff like that and the gang and gang youth and all that kind of stuff. So it and that might just be the trailer to me but just for me the trailer was trying to do too many things that I never got a sense of an identity of the film but Cedric the Entertainer when he just refuses yeah. to get down at the yeah. end of the at, at the end of the trailer because they're shooting he's like I'm too old to get to yeah. I, that, was that was funny, funny. Well, that's, that was that's funny. who's going to win it for me is Cedric so yeah. it's like uh, that's what I loved about the original barbershop Cedric and Ice Cube so yeah. I mean seeing those guys back and I want I want quality time in that barbershop that's yeah. all I care about all right, what's next? Sean Lallan writes, what bad movie would you like to fix to make better? Mine is Grown Ups. Mm. 
Uh, Grown Ups is a good one. I was going to say any Adam Sandler movie of the last five years. But yeah, I don't know really. if they, I don't necessarily even think you have to fix them. Just, just you know. Yeah, just I would let them go. Uh, you yeah. know, a comedy that I always thought should be funny, and then you go into the movie and you realize that this is just a bunch of famous people who wanted to go on vacation. A lot like what Grown Ups is, too, mm-hmm. is Couples Retreat. I mean, you got Vince Vaughn in there. I think you got Jason Bateman in there. It's just, it, it, it's a great cast, and they just got a free retreat out of it as opposed to actually making a funny movie. But you had a lot of great great comedy you could have put in there this might be controversial i would love to like uh fix the matrix sequels number two and three because the first movie is such an amazing film and the second and third film just really didn't live up to it and were very disappointing at least to me um where i felt certain sequences in my opinion could have been cut and other sequences could have been like moved around that would have like hey do a special edition george lucas that i would if the wachowskis you know, I, th- I think they, you know, they're a hundred percent into it. They're like, they, we wrote this, this and that. But if you ever, if they ever like, we'd love to revisit the matrix sequels and reshoot stuff and redo it or whatever, if it was tampered and taken away from them or something, I know that's not what happened. But. Well, you, you brought up the name George Lucas. How about the most obvious one? Right. Howard yeah. the duck. That's a movie that I <laughs> think could have been so much better than it was. Oh, and those three other prequel movies too. <laughs> All right. What else? Matt Stoker writes, if you could eat or drink any fictional food from any movie, what would it be and why? <laughs> I mean, my, my mind automatically goes to blue milk, even though when we were watching Star Wars A New Hope, it's like we're watching Aunt Peru cook, and Uncle Owen has this permanent look on his face where he's like, oh, God, she's cooking again. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, but the blue milk is something I'd have to try. Uh, death sticks, I'd probably want to try it, too, if we get out of the Star Wars universe. It's not universe. technically a food. Yeah, death sticks. Well... Yeah. I mean, some people yeah. survive on death sticks. Yeah. Yes. Like that weird time. guy. Would you like some death sticks? Um, <laughs> some death sticks? <laughs> any, any of the candies from uh, Willy Wonka, but they've mm. actually made them available, but they didn't taste the way I think they should have tasted. Not so. fizzy no. lifting drinks. They're still right. working on those. Um, a schnozzle berry or whatever those. Oh, what's the, the eternal flavor, the gum that doesn't lose its flavor? I want, I'm still yeah, waiting for that to come That would be crazy. Along. Yeah. All right, what's next? Nick writes, do you guys have drive-in movies in California or have you ever been to one? If so, what's your favorite memory? Hell yeah, we got drive-in movie, son. <laughs> City of Industry. It's one of the coolest right. ones I've been to. I went to a bunch when I was in Connecticut as a kid. The drive-in is a fantastic experience. If, if you have never experienced a drive-in movie, you should go because it is really fun. You go with a bunch of your friends. You pull up. You get your speakers. You bring some chairs. You go outside. You're I don't drinking. think they have speakers anymore. I, th- I think now they broadcast on oh, FM. Yeah, yeah. Re- recently, yeah. Now they, they do the actual, they have an actual channel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I saw Men in Black 3. And it sucked so bad that I was able to walk over to the other screen and watch <laughs> Avengers. It was like, hey, man, I'm out. I'm going to, you know, I can't even watch the rest of this movie. Um, yeah, usually drive-ins now, the way City of Industry works, they have, it's four screens. And they have two movies at each of those screens. So, it's it's great and it's kind of it's a different experience than going to the actual movie theater. It's a little more communal and in the center where all the projections are, they have like they have like you know you could buy a bunch of fries or hot dogs, sodas and candy. And it's like it really is like a, a fun experience if you never if you've never done a drive-in. I uh, I yeah my parents used to take us to drives all the time. Now this was up in Canada. I went, but I remember what my my last one with my family was. At any rate, this one will never leave me. It will never haunt me. I, I don't know what they thought people weren't going to see because behind me. But one couple was standing up in the back of a pickup truck having sex yes. while the movie was going on. Damn. And my parents just like just watch the movie screen. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm like, Wow. <laughs> so that was the last time my, my parents took me to go see the movies. I really hope that that woman had her contraceptive toast. <laughs> right. She's like, hey, where's the toaster? I need to plug there it in. It yeah. I, uh, I have never been to a, uh, to a drive-in, but I was actually hoping that you'd say it's a less communal experience because I don't like people. But if you go to a movie theater where you drive your car and you stay in your car, don't you have to deal less with people who are like chatting, like you don't have to worry about somebody sure. else taking out their cell phone. Yeah, during the movie, but I in am between. protected in the shell yes. of my car, and so I can just focus on the movie maybe easier than mm-hmm. I would if I was at a normal movie theater. But that's what you could do, and a lot of people do do that. But or you go and get a bunch of Coors Light, I'm hang listening. out with all your friends. We're all rocking, laughing, joking. Don't go see a quality movie at a drive-in. That's what I've got to emphasize. you got to go see a movie <laughs> that you're like, I'm on the fence about it. I want to hang out with my friends. There's a whole bunch of activity. There's people watching. It's fun. So that's what I would say. Where is the drive-in around here? Uh, city? city of Industry. Is it still open? Yes. Where is that? It's uh, it's 
called City it's in of Industry. Yeah, it's yeah. in LA. It's, it's about like 45 minutes out. South. It's like yeah. southeast. We're going to all, we should do a movie talk. That would be so much fun. We should do a movie fun. talk special where we like, you know come meet us. We'll that would be insane. A, we'll rent a giant minivan and we'll just crowd all of us. <laughs> yes. In. Because like yes. at my old one, at the one up in Canada, they would have like Tuesdays and Wednesday nights. You didn't pay per person, you paid per car. Mm. And you would cram wow. 18 people into your car, <laughs> load up your trunk with lawn chairs. You get there, get your spot, pull out the lawn yep. chairs, and open the doors of your car so you could hear the sound coming out. Out, yeah, and it was just a great group experience. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll do that. We'll do we'll do a movie talk goes to the drive, and you guys all yeah. go. Yeah, we'll yes. film it. We'll shoot it. I think yeah. it's a lot of fun. Five be cars awesome. down is going to be old man Ellis by himself. <laughs> no way. Car. You kids, I'm trying to watch the picture. We are going to make Ellis get so drunk off his Coors Lights, <laughs> and he's not going to be able to see the film. <laughs> all right, last question of the day. Okay, this has to go to Rashad H. Have you guys heard anything about anything about the Mean Girls spinoff, Mean Moms? <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's been a while. Like, there was a bunch of news that came out about that. Now, it's for those, it's not really a direct sequel, but it's written by the same person. It really has more folks to do on parents uh, than kids and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Tina Fey was involved on some level. I can't remember what it was she was going to be doing with it, if she was just writing or producing or whatever. But... And then it went quiet. So I, for all I know, it's in production right now, but I haven't heard anything about it in at least six months. I'm Did looking you guys? at the IMDb page right now. Jennifer Aniston yeah. is in it. I, that's Super right. That was the weird. last I heard that she got attached. But that was ages ago. That's one of those movies where you don't you hear it's in production and you or you hear it's it's going to happen or this star's attached to it, and then everything does go dark for a little while, and then you see a trailer and you weren't expecting to see a trailer. You're like, oh yeah, that's coming out. Right. So I think you'll you'll see a trailer for it, and that'll be the next news you hear. But if you see a trailer and it's good, I think. A lot of people are going to get excited about that movie. Uh, let's do one more just for the oh, hell of okay, it. Okay, okay. Um, Ezra Talks Movies writes, since all the comedies Paul Feig directed are rated R, do you think that the new Ghostbusters could be rated R? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. No, there's no chance. No chance they're going to go rated R with that property. What do you think? I, it, it would be funny to watch. It would be funny to watch yeah. because a lot of those ladies can swear a lot, but I don't <laughs> think it's ever going to happen. You don't have a sure. shot in H. Right, or extreme like ectoplasm gore of just them like sawing a ghost's head off for like 15 minutes. You're like, why is it not stop bleeding? Well, you think like, about it. Like, like, <laughs> was, can you look this up, um, Ash, just for a second? Because was the original Ghostbusters rated PG or was it rated R? It was because not rated R. Yeah, was, I did PG. think it was rated, rated R, but there, I mean, think about it. There's a scene where Dan Aykroyd gets a blowjob from a ghost. Not uh, I on think it's screen. PG. It yeah. insinuates his. Well, okay, the, yes. The fly but... goes down, his eyes go up, and that's what we see. We, we don't right. see like hardcore. Oh my right. think gosh. Was gosh. I don't remember this. You guys are like <laughs> ruining <laughs> my childhood. Yeah. What are you talking it's about? A, it's like that's the, the adult humor. I like, didn't the even adults get got that. it, but the kids didn't get it. Yeah, it's not like Slimer's going to town on Bankman and like he's watching. It happen. About. Right. No, it'll be PG. I don't even think it'll be PG. Thank you. Comes around the course, he's all yeah. this goo on his crotch. I, guess, <laughs> oh I mean, he does get slimed. So. Yes, he does get yeah. slimed. Was that a metaphor? I, I don't know. Just Wait, make sure. He got slimed. Make sure you know where to put that jelly, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, I think it'll be PG 13. Yes, I know. I totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. All right, folks. That'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. This one went off the rails. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing out our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Make sure you bookmark the site Collider.com, our website over there that keeps you up to date on everything going on in the world of entertainment. And make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over here on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can follow me just on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And you can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to tdoslwh.com. Support independent film. S currently searching on Amazon.com for Toast Jelly. Mr. Mark Ellis, Mark, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me there, and then you'll find me in Indianapolis <laughs> this Thursday and Friday. I'm at Morty's Comedy Joint. Happy birthday, Eddie. Yeah, it's funny. His girlfriend starts to suggest she might want a baby, and he starts giving her toast and jelly for breakfast <laughs> I've every never day. Heard, nothing, I, nothing, honey. I heard it's good. I've never heard of contraceptive jelly, though, in my life. Like, really? I've never heard of that. I just, you know, maybe I'm an old-fashioned sweetheart, <laughs> but never heard of this contraceptive jelly. It sounds gooey and maybe a lot of fun. Lots of yeast infection going on in there, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, of course, our lovely host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? On Twitter and on Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And uh, you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thank you so much for joining us, and until next time, bye-bye hey guys if you like this video click the thumbs up button 
Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.